Adventures in God, Incidents from the Ministry of Dr. John G. Lake, Part 2. This is taken from the Kenneth Copeland publication, John G. Lake, His Life, His Sermons, His Boldness of Faith. Part 1, we covered how I came to devote my life to divine healing. Part 2, then, today we're going to begin with how God sent me to Africa. I planned to go to Africa as a boy. I look forward to it through my young manhood. One day, I went out to help a chore boy pull a cross-cut saw. We were cutting down an oak tree, and as I did, the Spirit of God spoke to me and said, Go to Indianapolis. Prepare for a winter campaign. Get a large haul, and in the spring you will go to Africa. And it all came to pass. It is power. Power manifests in many ways. There is the power of faith, which draws to you what seems to be impossible. One day, after I had gone to Indianapolis, Indiana, and had been preaching for some time, my old preaching partner said, John, if we are going to Africa in the spring, it is time we were praying for the money. I replied, Tom, I have been praying ever since New Year's and have not heard from heaven or anybody else. He said, Never mind, John, how much will it take? I replied, Two thousand dollars. He said, Come on, John, we are going to pray. So we knelt down by Tom's bed and prayed. I heard him saying, Jesus, you told me you would send that money in four days. After a while, he slapped me on the back, saying, Don't pray any more, John. Jesus told me he would have the money, and it would be here in four days. Four days later, he came back from the post office with a letter containing four $500 drafts. The letter read, I was standing in the bank in Monrovia, California, and something said to me, Send Tom Hasmohaltz $2,000. It's yours, Tom, for whatever purpose God has shown you. So we went out and bought our tickets. I had a little money. Tom had bought the tickets, but when you are traveling with a wife and seven children, there are a lot of expenses besides tickets. We followed this practice. We never told what our needs were, but we did tell the Lord. So finally, all the little money I had was gone. When I paid the expressman, I had a dollar fifty left. As the train pulled out of Indianapolis, my secretary threw in a two dollar bill. Then I had three fifty. There was a lady in our party traveling with us as far as Detroit. I needed ten dollars to buy her a ticket to northern Michigan. As we rode along, I said to Mrs. Lake, Jan, I need ten dollars to buy Winnie a ticket. So we prayed. We came into Detroit at eight o'clock. As the train pulled into the station, my brother and married sister were there to meet us and among them was a younger brother, Jim. Jim was a student at the university. Jim took me by the arm, and we walked to the other end of the station. Then he said, Jack, I hope you will not be mad about it, but I would like to give you this. And he gave me a $10 bill. I thanked him for it and went and bought Winnie her ticket. I still had the three fifty left. We took ship at New Brunswick, so I bought some canned beef, canned beans, etc., 
and still had about a dollar fifty left. When we finally boarded the ship, I had a dollar twenty-five left. I gave fifty cents to the table steward and fifty cents to the bedroom steward, and I still had twenty-five cents left when we reached England. We were five days in Liverpool, and as we had through tickets, it entitled us to hotel expenses. I arrived with my party in South Africa about May 15, 1908. Before I could go ashore, it was necessary for me to put up a dollar, a hundred and twenty-five dollars with the immigration department, and I had not a cent. As I stood in the line of people who were making these payments, awaiting my chance to explain to the immigration officer my dilemma, suddenly a man tapped me on the shoulder. He called me out of the line and he handed me a traveler's check for $200 and said to me, I feel led to give this to help your work. On arrival in Johannesburg, I and my family had nowhere to go. We were absolutely strangers in the country and had no friends or acquaintances there. As we arrived in Johannesburg, a lady came up looking for an American missionary with seven children. She said, Oh, you are the family. The Lord has sent me to meet you, and I want to give you a home. At three o'clock that same day, we were in a furnished cottage. God had provided us a home, and that is how we got to Africa. Next, Dr. Lake has concluded his telling of that. Now we're on to another little statement that he made. Jesus never intended Christians to be an imitation. They were to be bone of his bone and blood of his blood and flesh of his flesh and soul of his soul and spirit of his spirit. And thus, he comes to us, Son of God, Savior, and Redeemer forever, and we are made one with him, both in purpose and in being. Ephesians 5.30 and 1 Corinthians 6.17 Next, he says, I was in the home of Del de Valeris in Krugerstorp, South Africa, one day, when a man came in who had traveled all over the country with a sunstroke, which had affected his mind. He had developed a great cancer. He had been following us from place to place, trying to catch up with me. He came into the house and proved to be a friend of the family. In a little while, a six-year-old child who had been sitting near me went across the room, climbed on the man's knees, and put her hands on the cancer on his face and prayed. I saw the cancer wither and disappear, so that in one half hour the thing had disappeared. The wound was there, but it healed in a few days. When the child laid her hands on the top of his head, he arose, saying, Oh, the fire that has been in my brain has gone out, and his mind was normal. Power belongeth unto God. The simplest soul can touch God and live in the very presence of God and his power. Next, one evening in my tabernacle, a young girl about 16 or 18 by the name of Hilda Daniels suddenly became overpowered by the Spirit of God. She arose and stood on the platform beside me. I recognized at once that the Lord had given the girl a message, so I simply stopped preaching and waited. The Spirit of God came upon her, and she began to chant in some language that I did not know. 
She made gestures like a Mohammedan priest would when chanting prayers. Away back in the house, I observed a young East Indian whom I knew. He became enraptured and commenced to walk gradually up the aisle. No one disturbed him, and he proceeded up the aisle until he got to the front. He stood looking into the girl's face with intense amazement. When her message had ceased, I said to him, What is it? And he answered, Oh, she speak my language. I said, What does she say? And he came up on the platform and stood beside me and gave the gist of her message. He said, She tells me that salvation comes from God, that in order to save men, Jesus Christ, who was God, became man, that one man cannot save another, that Mohammed was a man like other men and had no power to save a man from his sins. But Jesus was God, and he had power to impart his spirit to me and make me like God. While preaching in a church in South Africa, an American lady whose son lived in the state of Iowa was present in a weeknight service. Before, before the service began, she called me into the vestry and told me that she had just received a letter from her daughter-in-law, stating her husband, a college professor, had apparently passed into decline. He appeared to be tubercular. He had to give up his position. He was in a condition of great weakness and was nearing death. I returned to the audience room, and we were about to pray. I stepped to the end of the platform and asked the lady to hand me the letter. Taking it in my hands, I knelt to pray. I invited all present to join me in faith for the man's deliverance. My spirit seemed to ascend in God, and I was lost to all consciousness of my environment. Presently, I stood in the home of the young man in Iowa, about 10,000 miles from Johannesburg. The man sat by a hard coal, coal heater with a little boy of about two years on his lap. I observed him critically and remarked to myself, Though your face is hard, and chose no evidence of soul development or spiritual life, yet your affection for your son is a redeeming quality. His wife sat on the opposite side of the table reading a magazine. Observing her, I remarked to myself, When he got you, he got a tartar. I stood behind his chair, and laying my hands on his head, silently I prayed, God to impart to him his healing virtue and make the man well, that he might bless the world and that his mother's heart might be comforted. In this case, there was no knowledge of my return beyond that in a moment I became aware that I was kneeling on my church platform and had been uttering audible prayer and that the Spirit of God was resting deeply upon the people. Some six weeks later, word was received that the young man was again quite well. His recovery began on a certain date, corresponding exactly with the date on which prayer was offered. Another Adventure in God In 1912, I was pastor of the Apostolic Tabernacle in Johannesburg, South Africa. The ministry of healing through faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was one of the cardinal teachings of our organization. The sick were brought from all parts of the land. Thousands were healed through the prayer of faith. 
and the laying on of hands of those who believed. Our church was then enjoying a great period of spiritual blessing and power. Various remarkable manifestations of the Spirit commonly occurred. At a Sunday service, before public prayer was offered, a member of the congregation arose and requested that the audience join in behalf of a cousin in Wales. Join in prayer on behalf of a cousin in Wales, 7,000 miles across the sea from Johannesburg, that she might be healed. He stated that the woman was violently insane and an inmate of an, of an asylum in Wales. I knelt on the platform to pray. An unusual degree of the spirit of prayer came upon my soul, causing me to pray with fervor and power. The spirit of prayer fell on the audience at the same time. The people ordinarily sat in their seats and bowed their heads while prayer was being offered. On this occasion, some hundred or more in different parts of the house knelt to pray with me. I was uttering an audible prayer, and they were praying silently. A great consciousness of the presence of God took possession of me. My spirit rose in a great consciousness of spiritual dominion. I felt for the moment as though I were anointed to cast out demons. My inner or spiritual eyes were opened. I could see in the spirit and observed that there was a shaft of seeming light accompanied by moving power coming from many of those who were praying. As the prayer continued, these shafts of light increased in number. Each of them reached my own soul. Each brought an increasing impulse of spiritual power until I seemed nigh overcome by it. While this was going on, I was uttering the words of prayer with great force and consciousness of spiritual power. Presently, I seemed out of my body, and to my surprise, observed that I was rapidly passing over the city of Kimberley, 300 miles from Johannesburg. The next consciousness was the city of Cape Town on the seacoast. 1,000 miles away. The next consciousness was the island of St. Helena, where Napoleon was banished. Then the Cape Verde lighthouse on the coast of Spain came into view. By this time it seemed as if I was passing through the atmosphere, observing everything but moving with great lightning-like rapidity. I remember the passage along the coast of France across the Bay of Biscay, then into Wales. I had never been in Wales. It was new country to me. As I passed swiftly over the country, I said, these are like the hills of Wyoming along the North Dakota border. Presently a village appeared nestled in a deep valley among the hills, next a public building that I recognized instinctively as the asylum. On the door I observed an old-fashioned 16th century knocker. Its workmanship attracted my attention, and this thought flashed through my spirit. Hmm, that is undoubtedly, that undoubtedly was made by one of the old smiths who manufactured armor. Then I was inside the institution without waiting for the doors to open, and presently at the side of a cot on which lay a woman. Her wrists were strapped to the sides of the cot, also her ankles. Another strap was passed over her legs above the knees and a second over her breasts. These were to hold her down. 
She was wagging her head and muttering incoherently. I lay my hands upon her head and with great intensity commanded in the name of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, that the demon spirit possessing her be cast out and that she might be healed by the power of God. In a moment or two, I observed a change coming over her countenance. It softened, and a look of intelligence appeared. Presently, her eyes opened, and she smiled up in my face, and I knew she was healed. I had no consciousness of return whatever. Instantly, I was aware that I was still kneeling in prayer and was conscious of all the surrounding environment of my church and service. Then three weeks passed, and my friend, who had presented the request for prayer, came to me with a letter from one of his relatives, stating that an unusual thing had occurred. Their cousin who had been confined for seven years in an asylum in Wales, suddenly became well. They had no explanation to offer. The doctor said it was one of those unaccountable things that sometimes happen. She was perfectly well and had returned to her friends. Well, we'll stop there for now with our reading of Dr. Lake's Adventures in God. And we'll pick that up the next time. Oh, wasn't this last story just wonderful? When he was carried in the spirit like Paul or Peter, uh, Philip was caught away by the spirit. We read about it in the book of Acts. (coughs) There he was literally caught away body and everything. Dr. Lake was caught away in the spirit and carried to Wales. We never know when we get into a state of intense prayer, but what God may not catch our spirit away to go to someone and lay hands on them for healing. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful testimonies given by Dr. Lake from his ministry. So join me the next time, next week, for part three of Dr. Lake's Adventures in God.